So we'll be delving beneath the sea uh, for today's Entour Live, where Dr. Gary Caldwell from Newcastle University will be telling us about some concerning events that have been happen happening in the North Sea uh, on the northeast coast of England. So I'm going to hand over to Gary to talk to us about the mass marine diocese that have been happening and what may be causing them. So over to you, Gary. Thank you very much, Kieran, and thank you everyone for making the time to come and listen to what I've got to say to you this evening. Um, I'm very aware that many people in the audience will be already quite familiar with the background to this series of episodes, but equally there'll be others that you know, they might be peripherally aware of what's been going on, but they might not necessarily be across a lot of the detail, and particularly the scientific detail, because there's been a lot of coverage in the press relating to these die-offs. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just giving a little bit about the background so everyone has got the right kind of context. And this is a very politically difficult and complex situation. And so I'm going to steer very much away from the politics of this. And I'm going to stick very firmly to the science. And I'm going to try and explain what we as a group of sciences, scientists in a range of universities, and also importantly, a lot of uh, outside uh, expertise, often retired scientists or retired engineers who have joined up and helped us try to unpick this very complex investigation. Now, I've slightly changed the title as advertised in that I've now changed it to cause or causes because there may or may not be more than one factor leading to this series of mass mortalities along the northeast coast and being a series is really important there's also a strap line to my presentation and we can think about this as a tale of two dredgers or is it a victim of circumstance and hopefully that sort of strap line will be made clear as this presentation goes on. And unusually, with these talks, you often leave your uh, thanks and appreciation acknowledgements to the end. I'm going to flip that on its head because it would be inappropriate for me to kind of park everyone's contribution to this right at the end. All the people that have helped me and the fishing community start to unpick this investigation. I cannot thank you enough for your time dedication, perseverance, and goodwill. Many of you have kept us going through quite hard times when we've put up against multiple brick walls in our investigation. You've kept us going with your encouragement and your support, but also quite a few of you, through your particular expertise, have got access to bits of information and parts of the puzzle that we as scientists aren't really familiar with getting involved. You know, delving into licensing, delving into sort of the more legalities behind this. And so this is a really big team, a big family effort, if you like. And I just wanted to thank and recognize everyone right up front, and particularly the fishing community and all the people involved in the coastal villages and towns up and down the Northeast who have been at the coal face of these die-offs. They've really borne the brunt of it. And if anything, is trying to help those guys help us resolve the situation that's been the driving force behind the science and keeping us going. Because it's been a tough, tough couple of years working on this. But to give you the background, back in autumn, end of September, October, 2021, it was a normal day in the Northeast. And then all of a sudden, a normal day went to a completely abnormal day. We had a series of high tides that were washing in almost biblical scales of mass deaths along our beaches. And it probably wouldn't be inappropriate to even think about this as almost a plague because things in the sea die, they wash up. That's part of the normal course of events. However, they don't die and wash up to the extent that they are carpeting the beaches, sometimes to the extent that you're wading in sort of knee deep, waist deep in carcasses. That is so far away from normal as it could possibly be. Now, when these first series of mass mortalities happened, the headlines were all grabbed by crabs and lobsters because they were the most astounding and striking feature of the dead animals washing up on the beach. Now, it's important that you appreciate, and we'll revisit this at the end, that that is not the be all and end all. There were other things that died as part of this event, but the crab and lobster was such a striking feature that it, it was quite 
quite the event, quite stressful, quite horrendous for the local community. And so it's kind of become badged with a sort of crustacean mass mortality event and that sort of uh, name and, and um, feeling to it is kind of stuck to it to this very day. For those of you not in the Northeast, you might wonder, well, what kind of scale are we talking about here? So I've kind of cobbled together a few maps and obviously here we are up in the Northeast and the line that I've drawn in each various map covers the scale, the range at which these mass die-offs and wash-ups happened. So extending kind of from Peter Lee, which is just a little bit north of the River Tees, extending further down the coast towards North Yorkshire to Whitby, heading down to Robin Hood's Bay. That's roughly 70 kilometers of coastline. So it's not an insignificant stretch of our UK coast. But it was very clear that there was a ground zero to these die-offs. It wasn't uniform across the 70 kilometer stretch. There was an area <laughs> in and around the Tees mouth and the local beaches. That was where most of the die-offs happened. And that story in and around the Tees is going to be a, a feature we're going to return to repeatedly in this presentation. And over the course of this time, people have always been asking me, well, have, have, the, have, the, have the stocks recovered? Are they catching more crab? Are the lobster? Is everything going back? Was it just a one-off? Are the stocks recovering? Are the populations recovering? And the fishermen have always maintained they haven't. They haven't been recovering. Their, their landings are down. There's really almost nothing there to fish. But getting that evidence beyond sort of the apocryphal reports of the fishermen and kind of what we see ourselves when we go out down to the shore has been problematic. But very recently, one branch of DEFRA, which is the Northeast Inshore Fisheries Commission and Conservation Authority, they gather a lot of the fisheries landings data and they've just published their most up-to-date report. And there's a few really telling uh, points for you to take home from these figures. In fact, everything in red is the percentage drop in catch compared to what the local fleets were getting. And so kind of in and around the mouth of the Tees, Red Car and Hartley Pool, well, you're losing almost 90% plus of your landings. And this is more than a year after the die-offs happened. So in terms of the crab, the crab population has no way recovered from those events. There's a really deep resounding echo to the loss of that community. And we're not seeing any real signs that that's recovering even at this stage. Lobster potentially might be just an ever so slightly better good news story. Still not, still not a good news story really, because you still got substantial declines in landings again in and around the Tees area, but further down that die-off zone heading towards North Yorkshire, you know, landings are seen to be recovered although part of that might be some of the boats having to fish further offshore. So I just wanted to kind of show you these figures at the start, just to make sure you understand that this is not just a one-off impact. What happened in the mass die-offs continues to be felt within not just the ecosystem, but within the local marine economy right to this very day. Now, looking at some of these figures, a key term I want you to think about is is localized extinction. Because particularly in and around the Tees, Red Car, Hartley Pool area, it is for all intents and purposes, a local extinction event for the big crustaceans, the brown crab, the shore crab, the lobster. In terms of the marine ecosystem, that's you almost wiping out one level of your food chain. And you cannot disrupt the food web to that extent without there being repercussions. And we are seeing those repercussions in the fact that ever since those first die-offs, there's been a whole series of boom and busts in the populations of different invertebrates, be they mussels, be they whelks, be they brittle stars, be they starfish, their population explodes and then quickly dies off again. You might wonder why that's the case. For those of us who remember our days at school and doing biology, this is kind of what we would expect to see of what we were taught of what a marine food 
blockchain or being food web looks like. And it's quite a simplistic picture that we're taught. We get different parts of the system that capture light and they start to pass that energy through the food web, going from the seabed right up until the big charismatic animals that we all like. However, that in reality is a crass simplification of what's in the real world. A marine food web looks something much more like this. There aren't just simple sort of linear connections. Every different component within that food web is connected to multiple different other animals and organisms and plants in this incredible spider's web of interrelationships and forms this incredibly complicated network. And where you suddenly lose key parts of that network, it can have really very unpredictable consequences on what's happening. So these kind of two plots I'm showing you over here, although they're not directly relevant to the die off, they illustrate a point really well. Because what these are showing is what happens in a food web when you start to take out different parts, in this case, through fishing pressure. Because in many respects, the die offs are just like a series of overfishing because we've taken away a big part of our food chain, albeit through non-fishing pressures. But by taking out that big chunk, that big active part of what makes that marine system work, almost like the beating heart of it, that impact cascades through the west of the food chain. And all of a sudden, these ordinarily quite stable different parts of the system become unstable. It becomes unpredictable. And where we might have a marine ecosystem whereby fishermen might know, actually, this is a good time to go out fishing because we're going to catch lobster now, or we go out fishing at this particular time, and we might catch cod then. All of a sudden, everything gets destabilized, and what is known, what's understood, becomes a massive unknown puzzle. And I was trying to think of a way to try and illustrate this a bit more clearly to general public, and the thing I think best works for me is thinking about Jenga. If you think about the marine ecosystem as a tower of Jenga blocks, yes, there will be some that you can very carefully slide out and the structure stays in place. It might wobble and shimmer a little bit, but it will stay in place. But you know that there are certain key blocks in this. If you slide them out, the whole thing comes tumbling down and you lose that game. When you start to destabilize marine ecosystems as complex as they are in our seas, you are very much playing a game of Jenga, except the implications are much braver than just you losing a game and having to restack your blocks. So by taking out such a massive component of the food web, we destabilize everything else. Different parts have had their um, predation pressure taken away, so their populations can grow unchecked, and then they in turn end up starving because they eat all their food and that population can no longer be sustained and then they die off. So we get this boom and bust cycle and we see this right the way up the food chain whereby you have animals that used to feed upon the crab and lobster, that food source is no longer there. And we're starting to see you know, reports of fish being caught with empty guts. We're starting to see reports coming in of the local seal population are even more malnourished than they would ordinarily be. So these echoes, these pulses, these ripples of harm are working their way through the food chain. So let's get back to the Tees itself. Now, for those of you not familiar with the area, the River Tees, back in the heyday of the Industrial Revolution, was the center of industrial activity of the UK. It really had the vanguard of industrialization. But over time, as is the case with all these heavy industries, their day comes to an end. And the teas that was built upon the industries of steelmaking and petrochemicals, among others, a lot of those industries are in steep decline. Many of them have gone entirely their sites, their infrastructure are being mothballed and they're being decommissioned. And the grand hope is that we can replace that old sort of fossil fuel, dirty industry with a green industrial revolution. And that whole underpinning restructuring of the local teas economy has a deep root in the problems that we're seeing here. We're going to come back to that in a few slides time, but just fix in your mind, the Tees is a polluted river. 
the sediments in the teas are highly contaminated. They carry that toxic legacy of decades of heavy industry on the teas. That's a well-known fact. Everyone who lives in the teas, has worked on the teas, knows that you do not disturb the Tees River sediments because you're only stirring up a massive hornet's nest that you really do not want to poke. So where do we go here from the story? Well, go back to that strap line. Story of two dredgers. So we have the styles where all of a sudden these beaches being full of crab and lobster carcasses, justifiably everyone shocked, horrified, and utterly baffled by what's caused this. There was no obvious case. There was no big storm. There was no obvious trigger for what might have happened. But it was known that at the time, a new dredging vessel was brought into the Tees called the UKD Orca. I was undertaking what was called maintenance dredging. And that is keeping the shipping channel going into Tees port clear. That's a normal everyday part of the operation of the port. However, what was different here with this particular dredger compared to normal six day a week operation of the Tees port was that this dredger operated 24 seven for a period of 10 days. That in and of itself was unusual dredging practice for the maintenance of the shipping channel in the Tees. And that started to get people a little bit curious is there a connection between this intensified dredging and what we've seen washed up of all the carcasses? And at that stage, you can't really take that conversation any further because it's, it's pure abject speculation. But then we started to get data coming through from the Environment Agency and from CFAS, which again are part of the broader DEFRA agencies who undertook initial investigations into these die-offs because they have a statutory obligation to investigate these events in the chance that it may be down to a pollution incident. So we started to get some of that information coming through from some of the analyses of the crab and lobster. And most of the pollutants that you expect to monitor, you know, there was nothing unusual there in relation to a, a polluted environment like the Tees is. However, there was one chemical that came out in the analysis at staggeringly high levels, and that's a chemical called pyridine. And we'll talk about pyridine in this, in this lecture, and then we will look to expand beyond pyridine, looking more widely into the other contaminants in the teas. But we'll start off talking about pyridine now. So first challenge we had as a scientific community trying to understand whether this chemical pyridine had any role to play in the die-offs was the fact that there was nothing in the scientific literature that actually indicated that this chemical was toxic to big crustaceans. And ordinarily, if you're looking for something, you'll find it in the scientific literature. It's a pretty safe place to go hunting down for clues. So, but the fact that there was nothing there telling us that pyridine was or wasn't toxic, that wasn't the answer. So we had to go and we had to generate our own answers to that question. And that involved very basic science, getting crabs from a clean environment, bringing them back into the laboratory, exposing them to pyridine in the lab. So what you're seeing here in this photograph is a typical scene in my laboratory when we were undertaking these studies. We had um, tanks that we filled individual crabs in each that we dose with different levels of pyridine. But pyridine is a very nasty chemical, even to humans. And we had to take exceptional care when working with this, hence why everything is behind a sealed environment. And we're here seeing the, the, the ghosts of the researchers who actually physically did the work and helped me out. So we had to do these experiments in a very controlled way. And we exposed the crabs to pyridine of different concentrations over three days. And that, in terms of understanding the toxicity of these chemicals, is pretty standard. It's a, it's a very vanilla way of doing basic toxicology. There's nothing fancy, there's nothing clever, but it gets you information. And I don't mind saying it, but when we were doing this work, a big part of me was hoping actually we weren't we shouldn't see any deaths for the period. That's what I was hoping. I was hoping all the crabs would survive. And I could say, yeah, we can rule this chemical out. 
it must be something else. However, that's not what we found at all. The work that we did it involved a lot of exposures and we, we actually do get quite attached to the crabs whenever you're working with them. And it's not easy putting them into conditions where they get stressed because you're consciously poisoning them, making them sick. And then in turn, even the healthy ones at the end, you have to sacrifice, you have to take out the organs because you're looking within those organs and tissues for signs of stress that you can't see with the naked eye. Certain things we definitely can see with the naked eye. We can look at behavior. We can look at whether the crab is alive or dead, how it's interacting with its environment. And that's one part of the story. But looking deep within the organs, deep within the cells, that can't be done just by the naked eye. And you have to be a bit more interventionist. And like I said, you do have to sacrifice your crabs and get your tissues out. And you start to then unpick parts of a puzzle that you didn't really appreciate was there to begin with. Now, I'm not going to go into all the toxicological data because that would take too much time. But because of the general audience, what I do want to share with you is some of the videos that we've seen. Now, one key bit of detail that I haven't shared with you is that whenever the crabs and lobsters were washed up on the beach, they were not all dead straight away. There were crabs and lobsters that were washing up that were what we call moribund or dying, I well on the way of dying. And they presented quite distinctive behaviors and very unusual. So with the crabs that were on lobsters were on their back and they were, they were twitching and they were spasming in a very uncontrolled way. And probably the best way to try and visualize this is if you imagine a, a Parkinson's patient has got this uncontrolled twitching behavior. And now I imagine a crab or a lobster doing that as well. That's what we were seeing with animals that were moribund and dying before they eventually did die prior to them actually eventually leaving this mortal realm, they then progressed into a stage of paralysis. So these were reports that came in right across the die-off zone from a range of people, fishermen, dog walkers, even some of the scientists that managed to get down there. That was a common theme. And that is a very unusual way for crab and lobster to present and die. So we were very curious whenever we were watching the crabs exposed to period and how they would react. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. So this is a brown crab, one of the big edible crabs. Now this is actually, we started recording this a couple of minutes after we put the crab into the pyridine because we were taken actually aback by what we saw when we first introduced the crab into the tank. It first went in and it launched into really violent convulsions and it started to sort of do somersaults in the tank. So this is sort of, two to three minutes after those initial convulsions happening. But what I want you to notice are the fact that the crabs are on their back. They are trying to move, but they're starting to be paralyzed. So that pyridine very quickly went through that sort of convulsive step, that spasm step, and we're now into the paralysis step. And these animals were dying anything between 30 minutes and three to six hours of being in pyridine depending on the concentration. Now, the twitching behavior is a bit more obvious in this next video of the shore crab. And again, this is you know, a few minutes after we've put them into the solution, but you can see quite clearly, very rapid, uncontrolled twitching behavior of the legs. And you know, they will do this, they've got no motor control. You now, this is completely out with the control of the crab. This is their limbs acting under their own power. You know, it's a bit like if you sat there and someone, you go to the doctor and they, they bang you on the knee and you're, you're kind of, you're, your leg shoots up and you can't control it. It's very much like that, except it's not one knock to your knee, it's multiple knocks to the crab system and it's twitching away. And then likewise, these crabs will then go through that paralysis stage and then death will quickly set in. So this pattern of presentation of spasming, convulsion, then paralysis, then death was consistent across most of the pyridine concentrations. But really interestingly to me, even at very low pyridine concentrations where the crabs survived for the three days, it was very much as if they were drugged. Now, you, if, if you were to put your hand into a, a, a tank with a healthy crab, 
you would be a bit foolhardy because that crab is going to unleash wrath and hell against your fingers. However, crabs that were exposed to pyridine, bear in mind that there were no outward signs of any kind of stress. They were still alive. They were still breathing. They were still able to slowly scuttle around the tank. But if you approached them to try and pick them up, there was none of the aggressive behavior. There was none of the rearing back trying to snap at you with the claws. They were as docile and pliable as babies. And you could pick them up and handle them without any threat. And that's very unusual in and of itself. And that is even within non-lethal ranges of this chemical. So at this point, I just want to deviate away from the crab and lobster story because I don't want you to go away from this presentation thinking that's all that was really affected. It wasn't. There was a broad sweep of loss of particularly crustacean life beyond just the crabs and lobsters along our shore. Now, what I'm showing you here are a series of photographs from sites that we monitor, Newcastle University and Liverpool University monitor right across the UK. We monitor these as part of a long-term scientific project called Marklin. We're trying to understand the impacts of climate change on our marine intertidal communities. And it just so happens, purely by luck rather than design, that one of these sites that gets surveyed every single year for many, many years was slap bang in the middle of the die-off zone. And this is at Stace in North, North Yorkshire. So what I'm showing you here are photographs taken of the exact same spot on the exact same rocks or the exact same shore <laughs> over the last 12 years. Now, these are of barnacles, and this is different parts of the shore. High shore, so only kind of exposed, um, only sort of um, immersed in water during high spring tides, right the way down to the low shore. And as you can see, over the normal years, there's, there's very, very good coverage, healthy populations throughout. And then all of a sudden, we get to 2022, the summer after the big die-offs. There are no barnacles whatsoever, not a single one on the low to mid shore. It's almost as if the rocks were jet washed clear of the barnacles. And there were only a smattering of really quite sickly barnacles left on the upper shore. So again, the upper shore doesn't get immersed in the seawater for very long. What does that look like whenever you transform these images into numbers? So these are those images transformed into counts of those barnacles, again, organized by the height of the shore. So this is the 2022 survey event. And as you can see, there's nothing there on the mid to low shore and next nothing on the high shore. Again, compare that to all the years going by, particularly compared to 2018. This is the year of the beast from the east. Now, this is the year that we would expect if we were to see a major loss on the shore, we would expect it to see it as a result of the beast from the east. And yes, we did see it. There was an overall decline as a result of those really cold events. But what we saw in 2022 completely eclipsed even what we saw from the beast for the east. So this is a key bit of evidence that what happened off the tees that didn't just affect crab and lobster was something of a scale that we have not seen in decades on our shore. That just gives you an idea of the magnitude of it. Now, you should also be asking yourself, well, actually, 2022, wasn't that the year we had our own little mini heat wave where we went above 40 degrees? Surely, you, you cannot say, well, could this simply not be the barnacles being cooked on the rocks? Because the rocks, they got to temperatures of over 50 degrees. So that's an entirely fair question to ask. However, again, looking at this long-term data set, we had a site just to the south of Filey Brig and a site to the north, just up near sea houses. If what we saw at, at that site in Steith was down to climate change, then we would expect to see similar losses in the populations at these sites, particularly the, York, the North Yorkshire site, because I had a really, really high temperature. So what do those data look like? 
here we have our stay site and here we have our north shore site up at sea houses and here we have our shore site down the Filey break the north and south sites are well within the normal range that you would expect from a healthy location the site in states midway through that die of zone collapse to me this was this was the, the most convincing bit of information that what we saw at stays was not climate change related. This was very much linked to what we saw with the crab and lobster die off. So that's the message I want to get across to you. It's not just crab and lobster. There are losses and impacts right across the food chain. And if any of you have ever worked in the maritime industries, if you work in the shipping industries, that you will know barnacles are absolutely rock hard animals. And to have a situation whereby you're losing almost your entire population, something really, really drastic must have happened. So let's get back to the pyridine. Why was pyridine toxic to the crabs? And more importantly, why were the crabs dying in the way they were? This presentation of spasms, convulsions, and then paralysis, and then fairly rapid death. How can I, can I explain that, first of all? And that, that's where we have to delve back into real, proper marine biology. Less sort of the investigative pollution incident kind of stuff, but real, proper, deep thinking marine biology. And this is where the ideas really started to come from. There are a range of chemicals that are produced in types of marine worms called bootlace worms. Some of you who are keen on going down on the beach and turning over rocks might have seen some of these worms. Sometimes they're called spaghetti worms. They're not the prettiest of marine animals and they can be quite enormous. For example, this one, Linnaeus, can get to 40, 50 meters in length of a single animal. But what is really interesting with these is the venom that they produce because these are predators and these worms will actively feed typically on other types of worms. Here we have a polychaete worm that's being injected with venom by the bootlace worm and it's being paralyzed, but also they predate upon crustaceans. Here's another photograph of one of these bootlace worms injecting venom into this marine woodlouse. But what really got my juices flowing scientifically was the similarity of the structure of pyridine, which is up here in this corner, the sort of strange angular structure with the nitrogen bonded on. A lot of the venoms that these marine worms produce also contain this structure and they can be bolted together in different ways. So in many respects, a lot of these venoms are pyridine used in little building blocks to build the venom. And what got me very excited was the fact that whenever crustaceans are injected with these venom, they die in much the same way that we've seen with the pyridine. They, they spasm, they convulse, and then they become paralyzed and die, and the bootlace worm eats them. In fact, even before the chemical structure of these were known, the first scientists in a French marine biology lab working on these actually called this the crustacean convulsant factor, even before they knew what they were working with. So that, as a marine biologist, was a very, very strong clue of tying in a plausible explanation of why pyridine might be killing and interacting with the crabs in the way that we saw in the lab. And then what I'm showing you here is some data that will show you that pyridine is actually a neurotoxin for crustaceans. Now, you might be more familiar with the idea of neurotoxins and things like chemical warfare. We're all quite familiar with the threat posed by chemical warfare agents. We, we hear about this a lot in the news in different parts of the world, but most chemical warfare agents and neurotoxins are natural. And often they come from venoms because that's where they involve. So here, what I'm showing you is some, some information taken from an Australian crayfish. And this is quite a useful model to study because you can actually take the leg off the crayfish and you can put some electrodes into the nerve, into the leg, and you can expose it to different chemicals. And you can see these little sort of hillocks here. These are the nerve 
within that leg firing off a signal. So that's, these would correspond to a twitch in the leg. And this was when pyridine was applied here. And within six to seven seconds, even within this isolated leg, you are seeing the signal going through the nerve saying twitch, 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 spasm, spasm, spasm. It comes on quick, but it also leaves quickly because if you take away your source of pyridine, that residual response quickly dies off as well. So this is really strong evidence, pardon me, that pyridine in crustaceans functions as a potent and remarkably fast acting neurotoxin attacking the central nervous system. So how do we tie this back to the T's? Because this is all lovely as a marine biology bit of research, really fascinating, really, really exciting. But how do we pin that back to the T's itself? And here we have to go to the industries that have been on the T's, both historically and somewhat more contemporaneously. Now, what I'm showing you here is a table of chemicals all made from different pyridines from the same paper that did this study with the crayfish legs. And they've tested all these different chemicals on that, that exact same system with the isolated leg nerve cells. And they built this table of activity. So the chemicals that are up at the top are the most powerful, potent, fast acting neurotoxins against crab nerves. And then as you go down, the kind of the, their impact lessens. But look where pyridine is on this list. It's pretty near the top. So that is, again, strong evidence that pyridine even within a wider range of neurotoxins that attack crab and lobster and other crustaceans, it is a pretty potent contender. But the reason why I have drawn boxes around all of these is because up until only a few years ago, there was a chemical plant on the, south, on the north bank of the Tees that was specifically manufacturing pyridine and pyridine-related chemicals for a range of different end um, products like herbicides, pesticides, plasticizers. That's what that factory made. It was built to manufacture pyridine and all these other pyridine containing molecules. So delving into the order book of that company, all these ones that I've blocked off here were all on the manufacturing list of that plant. So that was an interesting bit of information. So potentially we have a site there that was making pyridine. Could something have gone wrong? Could there have been an accident? Could someone have turned the wrong tap and accidentally released the chemical into the river? Actually, the connection is a little bit more troublesome than that because we found out through a combination of, of whistleblowers and through information released at request from the Environment Agency that actually this particular plant was not properly tre treating its waste effluent, so its wastewater coming out of its manufacturing process. And it was either illegally hose piping it onto seal sands, which is along the Tees estuary, or later when actually someone pointed them out that they were doing this, they started to taking it by big truck, big tanker into the local uh, wastewater treatment plant. And then that was released into the river. So that was a bit of a concern to us because here we potentially had one direct route of pyridine into the river. But the, the timing of this wasn't great because the plant had stopped manufacture a number of months before we saw the die off. You know, so there's some, some doubt there as, as to try to, to combine those dots. So now what we're moving on, just to think about other parts of what was happening on the T's. And thinking specifically about the South Bank of the Tees, wherever we had the big steelworks. Now, this is this is work again that was being, being done by a lot of the people that have been helping me out, and they've really delved into kind of the, the, the industry legacy of this, understanding the practices and operation of these sites. So the, the South Bank of the Tees has got a big steel making industry, lots of other particular pollutants down there. 
um, including sort of metals and there's a big landfill site. So there's lots of different sources of contaminants that could have got into the river. Keyword there being could. Again, that's speculative. What could be the mechanism for potentially those chemicals being released into the river if that's the case? And here we have to kind of then revisit this grand aspiration of turning that old heavy industry of the teas into this wonderful vision of being the green industrial revolution for the next generation. And to make that happen, all those big heavy plants, the steelwork sites, all the cooking ovens, all the associated plant with those particular industries, they have to be taken away. They have to be demolished, taken off site, and the contaminated land should be remediated made clean, made safe, not just for the environment, but also for the new industries coming in to build and to bring the workforce onto their site. You do not want to have a toxic legacy that's potentially going to damage your workforce and certainly not damage the marine ecosystem. And this is where things start to get a little bit complicated because to, to properly remediate this site, it was estimated that that job should have taken in the region of 10 to 11 years to be done properly, to be done safely. However, that 10 to 11 year work program has been rushed through in a little over three years time. With some of the most spectacular demolition events that this country has seen, and some of the biggest explosions that we have seen in this country in peacetime. So this got us as a group wondering, is, is there a connection here? Could something have happened as part of that decommissioning demolition step that may have inadvertently allowed chemicals locked into the site to escape somehow by some mechanism into the river? So we start to apply our, our little minds to that and our little inquisitive uh, kind of nosiness. Nosiness is a great way to describe this because you get you latch onto your problem and you just want to keep pulling at that little particular string until you find something really interesting. And what I'm showing you here is a site, uh, a, a schematic diagram of this site, including this, this geology. We've got the river here. We've got the different areas of all the different infrastructure that's been demolished. This is all what's called made ground. So this is ground that, that we as humanity have recovered and we've built upon it. And then we have used that to build our factories. And then you have the natural bedrock and the natural geology underneath. However, a lot of chemicals that are produced as part of steelworking in particular, and I'm thinking of what a group of chemicals called coal tar, they do escape through various accidents or carelessness into the ground and they can sit here as like a big lump of nasty, sticky, bitumen-like horribleness that just sits in the geology. And ever so slowly in the normal course of events, it will creep its way along until it finds a way out. But ordinarily, that's fine because it would take a very long time for this big collection of coal tar and other chemicals to work its way out to the river under normal natural processes. However, what we have seen in terms of the remediation work on this site has been far from natural. And that has driven us to come up with our own, albeit slightly messy, new conceptual model of what may have happened. So you have all these enormous explosions that are creating shocks through the land, creating fissures, cracks, and effectively opening fast moving channels that would allow these chemicals that otherwise would have only escaped through a very, very slow creep, direct routes into different parts of the geology that they could quickly enter the riverbed and then collect on the riverbed itself because they are denser than water. And then potentially you could have the dredgers coming in and quite inadvertently, quite by accident, collecting up this dislodged material and taking it out and dumping at sea and then 
precipitating those die-offs. Now, where does pyridine fit into this? Well, pyridine is one of the big byproducts of coking, making the coal for the steel making industry. And it will be found within this collection of coal tar and it will be protected by that coal tar and it can be quite stable when it's locked in there. But if it then gets released into the river, transported out to sea, it could get released in quite high levels moving along the seabed. And we know that there were hundreds of tons of coal tar left on this site during the demolition. Equally, and I'll show you some videos, this bank has actually been dug out and cut back. So that route from getting the chemicals moving through the rock and through the made ground into the river was actually very rapidly shortened by digging out the river bank to extend, to extend the width of the river to build a new quay. And these things happened quickly, certainly a lot faster than the normal kind of timeline for these chemicals crawling their way out by natural processes. So that then led us on to the question, well, if, if pyridine is released as part of this process, whether it's through this chemical factory or whether it's through demolition and then moved by the dredging and dumped out at sea, can it actually be transported up and down the coast? And that's what I'm showing you here. I'm showing you a simulation of the movement of pyridine using the actual tides and winds and currents along that coast on the particular days from the dredging activity. And you saw the spread of the chemical moving down the coast and indeed a little bit north moved by the tide, going down as far as Whitby, and then it disappeared because pyridine is, is volatile. It gets lost to the atmosphere. It gets broken down. But what that kind of model showed is sort of stretched from sort of pre again right down to Whitby, it with, with uncanny accuracy mapped out the die-off zone that the fishermen were reporting. So again, that got us really quite both excited and deeply concerned at the same time. So we started to ask ourselves, okay, we know pyridine potentially could be released. We know it gets broken down and it can get lost to the system. Would there be enough exposure of crab and lobster that are along that coast for a long enough time to kill them? That's a really important question to ask. So again, we took this information from the model. We took the data from our toxicology trials in the lab. And we did some very clever numerical work with computer models. And what I'm showing you here, you don't need to worry about the numbers there. They're actually irrelevant. It's, it's the shape of the line that's important. So this is where the dredging started. And we ran this for the 10 days that the dredger was operating. And each of these, as the line goes up, this is showing that more and more pyridine is being released into the water. And it's building up faster than it breaks down because that dredger, like I said, was operating 24 seven for 10 days, constantly putting material out there. This point at the peak, this is where the dredging stopped. And you see a very, very rapid then decline of the chemical from the environment as it's lost through all those natural processes. So you get the sort of shark fin profile of buildup of pyridine in the environment and a rapid loss and decay from the water. But again, what does that mean? If I'm a crab or lobster and I'm sat here on the shore and I'm being bathed by this chemical all the time over you know, this period of essentially a month, will that expose me to enough of this chemical to cause me problems? Short answer to this is yes. Again, using computer modeling, we were able to work out basically the cumulative time, the build up time that a crab or a lobster sat living quite happily in the seabed was having pyridine washing over it as it was moving along the seabed. And we were then able to pull from that the probability of a crab or lobster dying very quickly within those sites. And we've put this onto a little sort of um, heat map color code and kind of the warmer colors, the red or the orange is where you have more of your animals dying. And again, these numbers correspond really well to what the fishing community were reporting in terms of where the animals were dying. You had this big hot spot near the T's mouth and red car, 
at both kind of the dredging site itself and the disposal site. And then as that tails off moving down the coast to Whitby, the length of time any crab or lobster will expose to the chemical reducers. But because pyridine is a neurotoxin, you're still losing animals even down as Whitby. And we kind of worked out that you would lose potentially 10% of your population, even as far down as Whitby. And you could lose half of your population in and around the mouth of the teas within the first 24 hours because pyridine is fast acting. So all our modeling, all our predictions map on with uncanny, uh, uncanny fit to what has been reported by people on the ground. And that's important because often these models, they don't get ground truth. You don't actually get real world data to back them up. But the reports of the fishermen and the local communities matches up with our models predict. But that's just looking at in the water. What about the sediment itself? Because, you know, it's not just pyridine that's going to be contaminating the river itself. And we'll come on to that shortly. There's so many other chemicals buried in that river tea sediment that you would not want to be released into the sea. And a lot of those pollutants stick really tightly onto the grains of the sediment, so the mud and the silt. And so we then we kind of developed our model and we started to ask ourselves, well, okay, what happens to the actual silt and the particles of the, of the mud and sediment themselves, ignoring just the seawater? Do they get moved down to match the die-off zone as well? So we did the same kind of modeling, but looking at the actual grains of the, of the silt and the sand, same kind of idea, we have the site where the dredging happened and the site where it was being disposed of. And the progress down the shore is slower compared to in the water. And there is a more concentrated buildup close to the river mouth because the bigger particles will settle out. But the really, really fine small stone particles actually will get transported to Whitby, actually even further beyond, heading down to Robin Hood's Bay, even potentially tapping down onto Scarborough and also moving even further offshore than the water, the period in the water would. So here we've got really strong evidence that the dredging through its activity and releasing potentially contaminated sediment would have created this environment of a very, very stressed, very, very toxic poison seabed through the release of this toxic sediment. And now we come on to the story of the second dredger. Because and I mentioned right at the start, this has been a very politically contentious issue. And some people were trying to argue the case that um, a different type of dredging called capital dredging. So you're actually digging out the sea, the river bed itself, making the river wider and deeper was the cause, as opposed to the other dredger, which is the maintenance dredging, keeping the shipping channel open. And the problem that we had with this was because whenever the capital dredging of this river to make a new key, which you can see back here, happened, it actually happened after the, the die-off started. But at this point, I want you to think about the diagram I showed you earlier with the, the demolition and the remediation of the site and all the land-based works that happened in, in actually clearing the South Bank site, because that happened before the die-off zone was formed. Those explosions happened before the die-off happened. So could there be a mechanism whereby all those contaminants were being released from all those explosions, from those poorly managed uh, demolitions and got into the river? And here, now we have proper capital dredging happening. And this is kind of where I want to focus the story now. Because those first set of big die-offs that we still believe pyridine was a major part of, you could argue was a one-off catastrophic event and the pyridine disappears from the environment. So in theory, the environment, given time, should recover. However, here with the capital dredging and the sheer volume of material being taken out of the river and the different types of pollutants that we already know are in those sediments, that presents a wholly 
different threat to the marine ecosystem. And that's what I want to finish off talking about. So we have an enormous dredger called the Athena, and it is what's called a cutting suction dredger. So it has this enormous, enormous really quite terrifying looking drill bit that it lowers into the river, into the riverbed, and it just turns this big screw and it chews up the riverbed. And in theory, it then sucks up all that released water and sediment through a big hose pipe and it transfers it onto that barge. This is meant to be a, an environmentally friendly way of doing dredging that minimizes the release of any sediment. What we're going to show you here is very strong evidence to the contrary. But then these barges will then go offshore six miles off and dump all that dredge material out at sea. So what does this look like when it's actually happening? So hopefully you'll be able to see this video. I'm not going to show all of it. I'm going to pick out key bits. So this is um, drone footage of this dredger in action. I'm just going to go through to key bits. So e even smaller vessels here, this is a very small uh, tug and barge. Even you can see small vessels are actually stirring up very contaminated sediment, even without digging into the riverbed. But if we then go on to look at what this big dredger is doing, you can see the sediment is not all going into the barge. There are sediment being released and escaping into the river, and that's being taken out to sea as the river flows out and as the tide then ebbs. So this is a really substantial operation. This capital dredging was happening for roughly three months. We had two these two, two enormous barges that were operating in sequence. One comes in, fills, fills up, goes offshore, dumps, while the other one comes in, and that operation continues. Then I want to show you this one final video. And this is another type of dredging that has been licensed and been described as environmentally safe dredging. Now, this is meant to be using a digger that should have a closed bucket digger that prevents sediment going into the river. I want you to watch this carefully. I want you to ask yourself, is what you're seeing a clean way to dredge? Is there any sediment released into the river? from this practice. So again, I'm only going to show you a little bit of it. So here you have the digger reaching down into the riverbed, scooping a part of the riverbed, and it's meant to put it onto this barge. But what's it do? Oh, hello. We don't even bother going into the barge. We're just going to dump that sediment right back into the river and stir it up like a really big toxic milkshake. And again, we've got other examples of this happening. This is, this is not how these operations should be happening. You should not be digging down into already known contaminated sediment and then stirring it up, making it into this really complex, horrible soup of sediment that then gets transported out again into the sea. And this is supposedly environmentally friendly, environmentally sensitive operations. Again, ask yourself the question, does the reality match up with its kind of advertising price tag and I would say no it doesn't and again watch what the digger does here doesn't go to the barge it's got this riverbed in its claws dump it right back into the water stir it all up again this should not be happening but what does that mean for for the sea so again I'm parking the purity and I'm moving on to this wider range of chemicals that we know for a fact are in these sediments. And this is not even work that we have done. This is data on contaminants from the contractor itself, the one that is actually remediating the site. That little digger dredger that I was showing you there with the non-closed closed bucket dredger, its task it was actually meant to be cleaning up a spill, a leak of contaminated sediment into the river. This data that I'm showing you here, it's kind of a traffic light based system, was data that was showing the level of contaminants, including metals and lots of other really nasty organics after that dredging, that supposedly cleanup dredging happened. 
if the concentration of a pollutant had gone down, so if it had actually got a little bit better, they come up in green. But as you can see, the vast majority of them are actually in red. So this supposed cleanup dredging actually made the whole problem a great deal worse. And these chemicals pose not just a threat to crab and lobster, they pose a threat to the entire marine ecosystem and also to us as end users of the marine system, whether they were surfers or swimmers or whether we are consumers of seafood. Because these, unlike pyridine, which will very quickly exit the environment, these pollutants will stay in the system for years. Some of them will stay for decades and they will accumulate through the food web. If the issue with the pyridine didn't cause you disquiet, then what you're seeing here should cause you grave alarm because it causes me grave alarm. Now, I'm coming on to the last couple of slides because what I'm hoping to show to you now is where we are currently at with the investigative work that we are trying to undertake and trying to unpick the wider threat that all these chemicals pose to our Northeast marine system. Because if we were trying to do what we did with the pyridine and undertake laboratory experiments with each of these chemicals, my goodness, we ourselves as scientists would be butchers of the sea. We would have to kill so many animals, we may as well just kill them in the environment anyway. Not, not mentioning the amount of time and cost that would take. So we have to try different ways of understanding the risk posed by all these chemicals without ourselves becoming the bringers of death to the system. And how we are doing this is at the most cutting edge of marine ecotoxicology. We are using a, what's called a machine learning or artificial intelligence, if you like, approach to try and understand the risks posed by all those chemicals that we know for a fact were in those sediments because the contractor themselves have told us that we know they've been transported offshore. So we have this very complicated system that we have designed using machine learning, pulling in information from three massive global databases. PubChem covers data of all the chemicals ever made by mankind. This US Ecotox database in turn has the toxicology data of as many of those chemicals as have been tested. And then this third taxonomy database covers about 10% of the global biodiversity on the planet, both on the sea and in the land. Now, if you were trying to unpick this information on the, purely on a human level, you're, you're never going to do it. You have hundreds of thousands to millions of bits of information that you're trying to pair together. This can only be done by bringing in machine learning. And that's what we've done. And this is the first time this approach has been attempted in the UK. Now, purely for simplicity's sake, all I'm showing you here is the data just for eight heavy metals. So basically this part of that traffic light system up here. And I fed in a number of animals that I'm interested in into the machine learning, the artificial intelligence system. And I've asked them, okay, here's all the different animals I'm interested in that I think are relevant for the Northeast. These are the eight metals I'm interested in. And, and then I also told it, these are the chemicals that we know are in the sediment. What our artificial intelligence then does it then looks at whatever information exists for all those combinations that there are, and there'll be many of those combinations that actually there are no information there because you can't do tests for everything against every chemical. But because this is a machine learning system and it can tap into all that 10% of global biodiversity, it's able to look at related species from all around the world that have got data and it's able to learn, it's able to teach itself how vulnerable each of these particular Northeast organisms are to the metals that we've asked it to understand. I hope that sounds complicated, but in effect, it's basically, we say this animal, what happens if it's exposed to all these metals at each of these concentrations? 
And whenever you're trying to interpret the information, in essence, the bigger the circle and the closer the color is to yellow, the more lethal that chemical is. Now, you should be able to look at this little diagram I'm showing you here and see straight away that nearly every combination that our machine learning system has pulled out, the metals in the teas at those concentrations are lethal. So they will be killing all these animals right the way from tuna kits, you know, right the way through to starfish, right the way up to lobsters, and everything in between. And in fact, probably the only things, the only combinations that aren't lethal are for the Pacific oyster for three metals and the brown crab for copper. So this is incredibly powerful evidence that even just looking at the metals, what is being dug up from the riverbed and dumped at sea is lethal to a broad swathe of our most important marine organisms. Think back again to that diagram at the start where you had that really complicated marine food web and all those connections, all those little networks, all those little strings of the spider web that you can tug. We've now moving away from just thinking about where do crab and lobster sit on that. I'm not thinking, oh my God, potentially we have the entire system that's now under significant threat from the pollutants that are going into this system. That is where we're currently at with the investigation. Whenever we get the other data that we are currently analyzing from sediments that we ourselves have collected from the river, we're waiting for information to still come from universities of Durham and York. We will then feed that new data into the model that I've built, and we will be able to create an entire risk picture for all the contaminants in all the sediments against all the marine life along our coast. And I am frightened by what I'm pretty sure we're going to see. It worries me beyond I can describe because potentially we could be dealing with a system that might not recover for generations. So I just wanna finish off by flagging. I'm gonna be doing three public events along our coast in September, where fingers crossed we will have those last bits of data and I'm gonna be able to go down and talk to you in groups in person, and you can question me in person, and we can have a kind of a really good conversation, but also we'll be looking at, well, what do we do next? What do we do next as scientists? What do we do next as a Northeast coastal community? What do we do next as a Northeast fishing community? How can we make this system better? Can we do anything to make it better? If we can't, how do we adjust? So it's basically, what are we gonna do over the next 10 years? If you want to be part of that conversation and you're able to spare a bit of time, please come along and hear what I'll have to say then. Talk back to me. Tell me what you want us to do. So the first event will be in Whitby in the James Cook Theatre on September 9th. Then the following Saturday will be in the uh, National Museum at Hartlepool. And then the final one in the little sequence will be at the Zetland Park Methodist Church in red car. So if you can make it to any of those events, you know, each will be more or less the same. Please, if you can come along, I would love to hear your ideas because you are the community. You are the people that have to live with the implications and the repercussions of what we are scientists as measuring. We want to be able to try and help you as best we can. And we want to work hand in hand with you to try and make our coast better. And on that note, I will finish. <laughs>